Harry's Wife, part 88.10, Sussexit. Hello, I'm H.G. Tudor. Sussexit. Doesn't really trip off the tongue. Megs it? Certainly did. And, of course, this appears to be latest creation that has appeared in relation to Harry's wife. We turn to the Telegraph newspaper, which, as always, I allow you to determine the veracity of the content whilst I provide you with the analysis to enable you to understand what's going on vis-a-vis the world of narcissism. An article by Judith Woods states, Sir Sexit is the result of a princely sense of humour failure. Megxit evolved from Brexit, but Prince Harry and his wife, Harry's wife, do not see the joke from their Monty Shitshow mansion. As any fool knows, but obviously not cross-patchy Prince Harry and Harry's wife, the secret to good comedy is timing just as the key to great headlines is rhyming. It's a big thing here in Britain. The tabloids in particular love a clever cadence. Throw in a cheeky reference to the monarchy, and it's guaranteed to be a right royal knockout. Of course, some of the wordplay has been downright scurrilous. The Duchess of Pork and Weighty Katie weren't the kindest of epithets. Then there was no sweat and no regret to describe Prince Andrew's bizarre medical alibi given during his excruciating Newsnight sex allegation interview. I could cite any other number of instances. When The Sun published that notorious photo of Harry playing naked pool in Vegas, it was accompanied by the classic, Hair it is, tee hee, and his father, Prince Charles was more recently lambasted for various eco-infractions with the inspired phrase carbon footprints. Quite clever, actually. However, near to the knuckle, our knockabout waggery has been part and parcel of public life since Pope, Swift and Hogarth first drew gasps for their sheer audaciousness. But sometimes... Headlines really are simply just a bit of fun. Like that snap of dazzling bride-to-be Harry's wife's megawatt smile, accompanied by the joyous jaunty, I'm getting harried in the morning, or Megxit to describe the couple's departure from these shores. A classic neologism that crucially rhymes with Brexit. I'm not sure there was anything more to it. In fact, I'm pretty positive there wasn't. But Harry's already failing sense of humour has chosen this hill to die upon by insisting the very word is misogynistic. And now the BBC has allegedly changed it to Sussexit. Pausing there, note how humour often plays a part in various headlines and that we have Harry determining that somehow Megxit is misogynistic. Now, as we know, he's not the sharpest knife in the drawer, but I'm still perplexed as to how the term Megxit can be viewed as misogynistic. Nevertheless, the fact that he deems it as such just demonstrates the extent to which his wife's influence has come to play upon him. The Playboy Prince is no longer the Playboy Prince, but he might be Playtime Prince, as he's relegated to the corner of the chicken coop there to play with his building blocks or to chew on a blue crayon. The fact that he comes out with such an observation, that is not classic Harry. It's not Harry at all. Instead, it demonstrates the extent to which his wife's influence has eroded his sense of self, resulting in him trotting out lines which really come from her. And this is a classic consequence of the influence of the narcissist upon the victim. Those of you who've been ensnared will recognise where your sense of self disappeared, your self-worth was eroded, your identity seemed to vanish. Why? First of all, the sheer force of our own personalities. 
the more grandiose extrovert narcissist basically steamroller you into becoming subsumed as part of who we are. It's all about what we want, the places we want to go to, the things that we prefer to do. Having mirrored you to begin with, we then get rid of those things and impose upon you everything that matters to us. Everything that once was important to you becomes stripped away. You become a shadow of yourself. Even with the more passive-aggressive narcissists that operate in a covert fashion, the mid-rangers, there, your identity isn't so much steamrolled over as rather leached from you. Death by a thousand cuts, as the little things that you always enjoyed are dispensed with, and the mealy-mouthed, whinging mid-ranger using pity plays and guilt trips and emotional blackmail, causes you to do the things that they require, leaving behind your friends, leaving behind your family, stopping that job that you enjoyed, no longer engaging the hobbies that you preferred, as your identity is stripped from you. Whether it's done aggressively or in a more subtle and passive manner, the narcissist removes who you are because we bolt you onto us. We assimilate you into our nation state. And this is what has happened to Harry. And that simple sentence of declaring that Megxit is misogynist is something that demonstrates that he has well and truly been bolted onto his wife, has been assimilated into her world of wokeism, and that he's now woking from home, coming out with phrases such as that. Continuing with the article, the writer states, snappy, Sussexit isn't. Quite the opposite. But that's what happens when playful versification is yoked to po-faced diversification. There are so many major wrongs to right on this planet, I'm bewildered by the sheer tone-death solipsism being demonstrated by two such privileged people. Pausing from the article there, of course, if the writer of this article, Judith Woods, had familiarity with what Harry's wife is, then her observation would not be in the same vein. She would recognise that the tone-deaf behaviour is redolent of the behaviour of Harry's wife as part of the necessity of the assertion of control and the drawing of fuel. That it is alongside her repeated hypocrisy of do as I say, but I then don't have to do as I say. I can tell you how to do it, I don't have to do it the same way. And this is where the tone deafness, the contrarian behaviours and the hypocrisy arises, because those volt fasts, the behaving like a demented weather vane in the storm, is all about the necessity of those prime aims, chiefly control and fuel. The narcissist will face both ways at once, inside out, upside down, back to front, without seeing that there is any complication in so doing, because the narcissism blinds the unaware narcissist to such behaviours. Returning to the article, it continues stating, The trigger this time is the documentary The Princes and the Press, the second part of which is broadcast on Monday night. Last week's opener was an eye-opener for many members of the public who had no idea, how could they, of the ways in which the media are privately briefed by sources from various royal family households. Monday night's episode will focus on the years 2018 to 2021 and was originally going to be called Megxit, a term which has entered popular parlance. Not in the Santa Barbara celebrity enclave of Montecchio, where Harry and Harry's wife live in a £12 million mansion it hasn't. Now it has been renamed Sussexit. I expect the Sussexes feel that they've won the battle. If so, and the jury's out, theirs is a Pyrrhic victory that speaks volumes about their concerns and motivations. Misogyny is a hugely serious, desperately urgent issue. It is why the women and girls of Afghanistan are being denied universal human rights, why British female members of Parliament are bullied and threatened on a daily basis, why some of us would rather stop a bus driver than turn to a policeman for help. Shrill arguments and peevish complaints over Megxit undermine the ongoing battle for justice, something this guilty high-net-worth pair are constantly banging on about. They have a voice. They have a philanthropic foundation, Archwell. 
They have an eye-watering contract with Netflix to make themselves heard on subjects that matter. Using their platform to settle personal scores is not a good look, or indeed, I'd argue, a good idea. But, again, were Judith Woods to realise who it is that she's actually writing about, she would know full well that any platform that a narcissist can get to will be used to settle those scores as part of the nullification of threats to control and the assertion of control, a platform for drawing fuel. Why do you think it is that so many narcissists operate media empires so they can control the narrative? Why do so many narcissists end up writing books, ending up in broadcasting, so that their voice is heard, that their worldview, that their lens becomes the one which other people are made to see the world through? Why do so many narcissists end up in the performing arts, becoming pop stars, songwriters, poets, authors? Again, to have a stage to deliver a message. And that message is linked, underpinned by the prime aims. Of course, Many of these narcissists don't know that. They just simply think that they have something to tell the world. Whether it's someone like Harry's wife, who is completely vapid, and beige, magnolia, who has no talent, no real message to deliver, or the narcissist that does have wisdom to impart, a skill set that can be flexed, demonstrative talent that entertains, excites, and enlightens. Either way, the sense of entitlement, the desire for control, be it unconscious or conscious, and the necessity of the receipt of fuel drives our kind to find the platforms. Whether it's standing on a stage at Glastonbury Festival, whether it's reading poetry at Speaker's Corner in Hyde Park, whether it is helming a multi-billion dollar media conglomerate, whether it's creating a foundation, whether it's signing a huge contract with Netflix, whether it is making a YouTube channel. All of those are platforms. Why do you think it is that so many unaware mid-rangers suddenly declare themselves to be narcissistic abuse recovery coaches? Because they have a platform that enables them to unconsciously assert control over a range of tertiary sources, that enables them to then draw fuel from those individuals and acquire character traits and, of course, residual benefits, such as money and facade management. Many empathic victims keep their stories to themselves. They mourn the loss of the relationship quietly, amongst perhaps families and a few family or a few choice friends. They don't instantly think, here is my message and the world must hear it. Invariably, but not all, but invariably those that bang the drum about their treatment at the supposed hands of the alleged narcissist and do so again and again on the very public of platforms, creating their own channels, wailing and a gnashing of teeth of it, are mid-range narcissists seeking to settle scores in the way that Harry's wife does. The article concludes, Their determination to call out every perceived slight as sexist bespeaks a toe-curling self-importance that might play well with their multi-millionaire Hollywood chums across the pond, but here at home were less enthralled to A-listers. Healthy scepticism and tongue-in-cheek disregard is one of the defining features of British culture. The BBC may have felt they had to ditch Megxit. The rest of us will Sussex it and see. And this author clearly identifies the fact that there is the use of this platform by Harry's wife and Harry being dragged along at the pink pancakes that he is to call out every perceived slight as sexist. That is the manifestation of Harry's wife's need for control. That where anybody says anything that disagrees with her, that is viewed as a criticism, where it's constructive or merited on the evidence, that does not matter. It's hate speech, it's sexist, it's racist. And similarly, with the use of Megxit, this has now been determined in a 1984-esque alteration of the use of language to suggest that a term such as Megxit is actually misogynist. No, 
It describes one of the individuals involved in departing the royal family. And let's be clear about this. Harry was the spare once again. Spare to the British throne, spare to his wife's ideas, spare to the exit. It was her decision. She drove it, driven by her narcissism, and he, the victim and thrall to her, given by his own emotional thinking, was left with little choice but to go along with it. He was looking at escaping to Africa. What of those plans now, Harry? Do you still pine for the veldt, or are you content to stand there, utilising the water from the springs beneath the Montecicco mansion to make sure that they remain a verdant lush green, whilst gazing on the parched land around you? His plans lie in tatters. Why? Because he is spare, secondary, the supporting act. And his wife continues to utilise the stage to settle the personal scores, as this news article demonstrates. I'm H.G. Tudor. Thank you for listening.